Some cool startup around the world. Yeah. Size doesn't matter, or at least switch to Alpine Linux. Since the network is so awesome here. Yeah, I was just trying to get on the network and not. I saw also there's a talk on bad USB here as well, so that's. Um, <laughs> you can choose to, well, it was my computer, so you can choose to. <laughs> I know, I'm just putting bad stuff on yours, that's oh. all. Thanks. Actually, the network is pretty fast for me. Yeah, so. I think. And it's not logging on. It's not a matter of fast. I'm We're using the VGA, right? The yep. gateway thing's not doing its thing.
my guess would be that you all know this guy. If not, this is Tim Fling, and he will tell you something about automated testing in Fedora as soon as we It worked like early. It worked just an hour set. ago. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Maybe there is an automated test for that? You know, there maybe there should be, but I think that's in the back. I guess. Let's see. It's a, a virtual machine image. Uh, can you use, so can you, can you use uh, MDMI? Nope. No. I've got all my adapters at home. Uh, do you need one? Do you have a mini display port to HDMI? Yes. <laughs> because I tried that uh, before too, and for whatever reason it doesn't work. No, it, but that's what I did my... I did my presentation earlier today on it. I'm not. It worked. Yeah. Well, you saw the slides, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> because I tried that before with the Apple adapter. Yeah, whatever. It was good. Maybe there's a different version of these adapters around. That's, uh, people actually wanted to hear what I have to say, and <laughs> man, that hurts. I'm here for you. <laughs> Sweet, we got at least one person. <laughs> I feel better now. Andreas Warm fuzzies, you're back. I suppose it is probably about time to test or start. Um, all right, so I have slides if you should want to, because there's a bunch of links embedded in it that are probably going to be easier to click on. And then from there, it's um, you can't tell I was a Java programmer in a previous life. Um, but Matt has the one USB stick I have with all of the files on it. Um, there's a bunch of stuff to download um, and repost to clone. Uh, the purpose, the, what I'm planning to do is, well, the original plan was to go through and teach everyone how to write tasks for Taskatron in particular. Um, and before I start, I do want to say that we are just getting into having people that aren't the core developers writing tasks. So when you hit pain points, please tell us because it's things that we want to fix. It's things that we need to fix. Um, I mean, even just preparing for this talk, I hit about 10 things that just dog fooding. It's like, well, why is, why do I have to do it this way? So if you find things, please tell us. Especially strange, huh? <laughs> The same old, so this work, <laughs> I swear this worked yesterday. I'm going to trace back, Tim. I blame you, Max. It's fair.
Yay! It ran. Oh. I never remember until I'm sitting up here, it's like, yes, white, because white on black text is so easy to read from a projector. Or white text on a black background. You don't need to read this bottom part doesn't matter. Um, I had all this stuff ready. All right. So All right, so hopefully these slides are the same as the ones I put online. Um, the like I said there's a bunch of there's a bunch of links in here. Um, and I suppose I should probably start with telling people the stuff to download. Um, cuz being at a conference and relying on network is always such a great idea. Um, so, where did the the USB stick go? If anyone's planning, if anyone wants to actually write the task, um, there's a bunch of files on there that I would suggest getting. It's kind of slow because it's. Uh, Three gigabytes. And the yeah the and the the files in there it is a virtual machine image it is some Git repositories with tasks in them, and uh, the contents of the Copa repository if for some reason your machine can't get to the the network. Um, most of what you need is this command here. Uh, the oh. Um, where did that slide go? Oh, for right now, um, it's only going to work on Fedora 23 and newer. Um, or at least the exact way I'm going to be telling you to do it. If some Does someone have something like Fedora 22, Fedora 21? Do you do? Can you go back with the slide? <laughs> Sorry. Fedora 22 or you Fedora 20, 22? Okay. Um, <laughs> Quick, DNF upgrade. <laughs> no, I w well, I'm not going to stop you from doing that. I would heavily recommend not doing that. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to think of the best way to, to do it. Okay, I mean, because the, the problem, the reason it's at 23 plus is the way that we spawn virtual machines is written in a way that requires a newer uh, libvirt bindings than what's in Fedora 22. Um, I think it's possible to fix it. It's just one of those things. It it works for us. It works on my dev machine. What's wrong with yours? <laughs> um, so if you you can either create the virtual machine, um, and uh, and I'll I can show you some. I can I will show somewhat. You can point lib task and try out the pre-created virtual machine. Um, that will work. It's just the spawning that isn't going to work on Fedora 22. Oh, sorry that you're raising your hand. Um, so just for my reference, who all is trying to follow along to create the task? All right. What about the others? Huh? What about the others? <laughs> Checking your email. Checking your email. I mean, I figure the three of you guys are here to throw out vegetables at me. I can just follow and do it. The slides, um, I... Still need to. Comp they are complete enough for me to do this today. They're not really complete enough for someone to follow along at home. Um, that will be changing. Uh, the link will stay the same. Um, this, and I will update that with the remainder of the instructions. Um, and if all else fails, the full example is in a Git repository. Is, uh, it's in a Bitbucket, Bitbucket repository. Uh, the link is also in the presentation. 
Um, I think it says something about cheating. Um, yep, the, the link here. Uh, it's already in Git if you want to cheat, or you can write it from scratch. It's up to whomever. Um, but if that uh, USB stick is making its way around, um, I'll get started on, Do I guess the... Hmm? What's making that cool little flippy thing in your slides? Huh? Um, why can't I think? It's a JavaScript. Um, why can't I... It's been a long time. <laughs> why can't I think? It was so cool. Um, reveal JS. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. That's what it is. Uh, I'm not sure if you know about... Uh, do you work for Reddit? Yeah. Okay, so Reddit has a corporate account on Slidescom, okay. which uses real JS. You could use that if you want. I don't know, I've never seen you run before. Are you sure you work for Red Hat? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a community guy, man. And one of the never sure. Did you see my Did you see I my think I'm, 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 one of the, I'm one of the sneaky people. Uh, <laughs> Um, all right, so getting into this, um, okay, my name is Tim. Um, this is, and I'm going to be talking about uh, automated jobs in Fedora. Um, this, more than most other things, I plan to be very informal. Um, if you have a question, please get my attention, even if that means doing something you might consider rude. I would much rather have the que like answer the question at the time than to know or to find out about it later. Because um, odds are, if you have a question, someone else is going to have the question. So, um, that being said, uh, some of the stuff I want to go over today is just a little bit of introduction, um, talk about some of the systems that are available in Fedora, which I'm probably going to breeze through because I think ever, most of the people, if not everyone, either already knows it or was in my presentation earlier. Um, and then basically start getting into how, the more the guts of how Taskatron works, um, specifically the runner within Taskatron and start getting into writing a task to test the Apache HTTP uh, package. So at the risk of sounding like a pitch for Zombo.com, um, you can do anything with Taskatron, anything at all. The only limit is yourself. <laughs> um, and I, it is kind of, I mean, it's the Taskatron itself is designed to hand off to other things. Um, I am not uh, naive enough and I am not full enough of myself to say that I know how to test everything better than everyone else does. Um, so the idea is to have Taskatron coordinate. So it will schedule the jobs, it will provision the virtual machine, and then hand off to someone else's tool. Um, you know, if Matt wanted to test Docker, or if Camille wanted to test frame rates on um, X. <laughs> um, you know, they may know more about these things than I do as someone who is, you know, administrating Taskatron or writing Taskatron. So when I say it can do anything at all, that's kind of what I'm getting at, is we aren't, we are, the idea is to hand it off to something else and to get the testing tools in the hands of the people who know how to test the things that need to be tested rather than assuming we know better than they do. Um, oh wow, I didn't take that slide out. So um, I have a couple of things because the way that I define these things aren't as common. I do not like the word automated test. Um, I think it is overused and I generally do not use it. Um, the reason I don't use it is because I'm a big believer in the value of human testers. Um, and by equating the things that a machine can do with what a, what a human can do, sort of denigrates what that very capable and smart human can do. So I tend to use the words task and check. Um, a, che a check is a kind of test, um, but the idea of a check is what most people think of as an automated test. It is something where you run it and it gives you a binary pass or fail. Um, so all checks are tests, but not all tests are checks. Um, and in most cases, when we're doing test automation, what we are interested in um, is checks because we want to be able to feed that binary pass-fail answer through a system um, and use those results for something. Um, and then the task is just purposely vague. Like one of the reasons this is called Taskatron is because it's not limited to what we would consider, usually consider automated tests. Um, the whole I, one of the big things behind it was that 
Um, especially in Fedora, everyone has more to do than they have time for. And, uh, you know, instead of having, you know, 10 different automation systems set up by, you know, 10 different people, one to go do kernel and one to test the, the graphical stuff and then another one to go, you know, do all this kind of stuff, that's a lot of overhead. So the idea was that the system will work on tasks. So whether that be static analysis for code, whether that be, you know, running things that we would traditionally think of as an automated test, um, any of those things are tasks and pretty much can be automated with the system. So, um, I'm just going to breeze through this because I'm pretty sure, is anyone, was anyone not, doesn't either know these three systems or was not in my presentation earlier? Okay, I will go through quickly. Yeah, if you can go quickly through how, how Beaker is available in Fedora because I didn't know we had that already. Yeah, that seems I, to, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a message <laughs> messaging issue because most people say that. Um, <laughs> is it ready now? It's new. It is mostly ready. Because I know you had given me access like maybe Ago and I could get in, but I think I was trying to request a system, but it, I don't. I don't think I ever got one. Hmm. But I did not know about that. The <laughs> staging yeah. system should be working. The production system looks like it's working, but it really doesn't. Uh, maybe I was, um, maybe that's what I was getting. At. Uh, so it's uh, it's a matter of me finding the time to redeploy. The system's production is pretty much what it's lacking. Yeah, or um, but the stage, the staging, when other systems it depends on aren't broken, staging works fine. Yeah. Um, right now it doesn't work because for some reason the staging um, auth systems are down. Gotcha. I think maybe that's the one you you told me to ignore an error when you first yeah. log in or yep. something like that. But if we, as part of this at the very end, if we just went through getting a system in Beaker. We can try. The, I tried getting it. I've been having network problems all day. Okay. So um, we can try, but I make no guarantees that it will actually work. Um, so Beaker is a um, system originally developed by Red Hat. It is still maintained by Red Hat. It is used extensively to test RHEL. Um, it is a combination of a test automation system it's a test coordination, test automation system, and um, lab management. Um, so the idea is to manage, so you have a, a lab of test systems. So Beaker can manage, okay, this one's getting this test now, this one's getting this test, and um, you know, run things through to try and make things as efficient as possible. Um, it is, in my mind, very good for tests that require bare metal. Um, and things that are generally a bit longer. Um, most Beaker workflows work as you are given the machine, it does an install with Anaconda, you get the machine, you can prepare it, then you run the tests. You know, if you have something that takes, you know, 30 seconds to a minute and you are installing an OS via Anaconda every time, that, I'm sure there might be a use case or two where that makes sense, but it seems a bit silly. Um, but that being said, I've done hardware automation before. And I will. I have no intention of ever doing it again if I can get away with it. <laughs> so they're doing it, and as long as I can piggyback off their work, um, he's he works on Beaker. Um, I am very happy to do that. Um, I'll get more into Taskatron. Um, OpenQA is uh, was originally from the OpenSUSE people. Um, it is, in a nutshell, it takes screenshots and it has pre-recorded screenshots. So it goes through running a test, it takes a screenshot of the graphical output, and you tell it, okay, there's this little button I'm looking for and here's a picture of it. Go find it, if you can find it, click on it. Um, and a, a tree of tests, like of, of steps that would make up the test. Um, it's something that's very good for graphical testing and it's something that's very good for environments where you can't have like a testing interface, the testing back, like where something like Dogtail, you can't look at the, um, the accessibility information, you can't put some sort of test interface to facilitate your testing. Any questions so far? I do. If you write a test for OpenQA, well, does, it, does it have to be in a certain language? It has to be created through the OpenQA web interface. Okay. Alright, well, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Oh, he's, oh. Uh, ask the question. He's, he, has, he, will, he knows more than I do about OpenQA. Okay, uh, so I'll try to finish up. Basically, uh, what you need to do, uh, you need to provide the screenshots and some metadata. You can screenshots, like pictures. Mm -hmm. well, yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I like pictures. Um, but I, if
doesn't necessarily need to be a picture because it's basically fragments, but we usually do it in a way that we take a screenshot of, of, of a virtual machine, stuff like that, and then we say, okay, this part here is a button, this part here is something like that, okay. and then you can eternally use these uh, fragments. Okay, so it's graphical. Yes, okay. yeah, exactly. So it's mostly for graphical. Okay. Uh, yeah. You can do this via web interface, which is very user friendly. You can do it by hand. You can use some other tools that I don't use, but I know Adam Williams uses this, stuff like that. Okay. And then you just, you just write the test in Perl, but you are not using Perl too much because you are just using a library. Like you are using method calls. Right. It could be anything. Like it's as simple as anything else. Like you just call some methods. You don't necessarily need to build deal with Perl as such. Okay. So, so you don't have to write your test in Perl. You yes. just have to hook your test. Hook to your test using Perl. Because yes. I, I that was a misconception I had yeah. when I looked at it originally. I thought. Yeah. Oh, I'll have to write all my tests. You, you, you basically just write the script with the tests in Perl, okay. but you can provide the data, like the images with the fragments with the data. You provide it like any way you Okay. Thank you. Cool. This is just an example of the front end. Um, this is a failed run from last night. I don't know enough about about OpenQA to tell you exactly what, what went wrong, um, but that's what it looks like. Okay. If you have questions, we can. Yep. Yeah. Open QA questions are best sent to him or Adam Williamson. Um, are the two that are the best to ask open QA questions to. Um, any other questions before we get into more uh, detail? The USB stick. Where is it? Yeah. Oh, sorry. All right. So. Um, does anyone still need this URL? I suspect I'm going to be drawing stuff. So within Taskathon, there are we have three different real ways to execute a task, and we call them local, SSH, and libvirt. Um, local execution is pretty much what it sounds like. It reads in the task and it will run things on the system from which it was executed from. So if I was in local mode and I ran from my laptop, it would run those commands on my laptop. Um, and it's good for quick local execution. It's good for development in certain cases. Um, things where it's you need it to be quick, it's not destructive, it's not going to cause any problems, um, is usually when it's useful. We start getting into the more complicated stuff. Um, which would be then SSH. So this basically then delegates the execution to a remote machine. So if I were to use SSH mode on my laptop and I had a virtual machine, you know, I start the task, it says, oh look, I have a virtual machine right here, I can log in. And then instead of running things locally on my laptop, it put, does them on whatever that remote machine is. And then when it's done, it knows where the output's supposed to be. It gets the output, extracts it, puts it back on the machine from which you started. Um, and that way, you don't ha you can run things on a remote machine. So you could you know delete the root file system. You know you can install packages and not have to worry about side effects. You can run on different versions of Fedora. You could run it you know on other things or other versions than what your your starting system is. Um, and it just gives you quite a bit more flexibility. Um, and it's, in our mind, it's generally used for development, um, which will make more sense in a second. Um, but as far as how this actually works, does this make sense? As far as, you know, you start from the machine, it sends commands to wherever your target is, and, you know, when all that's, you know, back and forth, it does all the commands, does the task, and then when it's done, we go, we know where the output's supposed to be, we extract it and bring it back to where we started from. Does this process make sense? So then we get into what we call libvirt. And this is what happens in production. Um, basically, we start with our execution. So I'm on my laptop. I'm going to start this in libvirt mode. So I point at a task, and it looks at it and says, OK, I need a virtual machine for this. So it finds uh, an image. It spawns a virtual machine using that image, gets the IP of that, and then basically does the SSH 
The same thing with the SSH execution. So, but it's, um, instead of the VM being there to start with, so um, we create the virtual machine. But then that process is the same, where it sends the commands to the virtual machine, um, does all the tasks, gets the stuff out of it when it's done, and then when all of the that execution is done, when all of the output is out of that virtual machine, it kills that virtual machine, leaving your the system you started in in basically the same state um, as you as when you began. So are these like basically plugins for different modes of application? So if it would, how easy is it to add another one? Um, I'm assuming you're talking about like the, the cloud use case? Yeah, or just uh, a test and a container use case, which is made faster than a VM. Oh. Um, and right now, containers aren't really possible. Um, the reason we went that direction is we're trying to satisfy, there are cases where a container won't work, but there are no cases in which a virtual machine won't work. Um, there are a lot of times when you want that isolation at this level. Um, so we may end up doing containers in the future, but that's not on the immediate roadmap. Yeah. Um, in terms of selecting another, like a, another target virtual machine is not yet supported. That will be coming relatively soon. Yeah. How do you work with multi-machine tests? Um, that comes along with, the, we don't support it yet. <laughs> um, it's on the roadmap, but it's sort of, we're trying to do baby steps. So now we've got the, the ability to isolate the, the task execution, um, which was what big blocker for us. Um, and the multi-host and selecting images are going to be coming later. Where do the images come from for the virtual machine? Um, they can come from just about wherever, um, as long as it's like a Q cow, as long as it's um, it's my problem. Mm -hmm. It's my problem. It can't. Well, I mean, it can, I'm, just, I'm saying it can be flexible. We do. I do publish uh, the virtual machine. Like we have virtual machine images, and we publish them when we rebuild them. Um, that's what was on that USB stick. Was one of those virtual machine images. Yeah. That is. It's basically a minimal Fedora install, and it has the the Taskatron packages on it, and that's about it. Oh, and we pre-populate the, the DNF cache. Um, so you can do either way. You can either use the Fedora, like the, any of the Fedora cloud images. Um, anything that's going to, anything that test cloud supports, which is what we use to boot the virtual machines. And for now, that's Red Hat land. So one of the Red Hat derivatives. So there's or client can. packages that need to be inside of I know, I know you, you don't have to have it, but you mentioned a rebuild VM. There's client task from packages, like a, like a uh, something that can talk back to the host or what? Kind of. Um, you do, they don't have to be there. Um, okay. As part of the spawning process, uh, the, the task will check and see if libtaskatron is installed. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically, I mean, it, it's relatively simple. You, like, from here, if I, like, if this is a separate computer that I'm, like, a, a representation of that remote machine, and this is where I'm starting from. Right. So I start here. This spawns this computer, right. and then checks to see if libtaskatron is installed. Right. And then it SSHs into here, runs libtaskatron in local mode, and does all of that stuff, and then extracts the output. So it's not... It is a client, in a matter of speaking, right. but it is not. It is basically just the same thing without SSH. It's just the same as putting it in that local. Yeah, mode. I was just wondering what the benefit is of, uh, I guess, having the client in if it was necessary. If it wasn't, what you're saying is it is necessary, but you don't have to have it in there when you start. But yeah. Because it will install it for you. Yeah. Right. Correct. But could you not do something like, kind of like what Ansible does, where it just copies over the things that it's going to execute, or to we, that way you could just use the cloud and yeah. not have to rebuild it. There, I mean, you don't have to rebuild it. We do it because it's faster. Yeah, okay. Um, because uh, we want the DNS, ca we don't want to be ca uh, updating the DNF cache every time we spawn a virtual machine. So we want the DNF cache. We want to have libtaskatron in there already. We probably could do it that way. Um, but that, I that think, would just be kind of cool because then literally you can bring whatever image that you build yeah. and, and run it through. You, you can. It's like there is. I think it's like misconception. The task button is not a client. It's just a runner. So it's just yeah. like a binary that you run right, exactly. and give it to the test. So, so, so in, in all honesty, we could do that. Yes. It's not something that. It's not something we've designed for. It's not something we do. Okay. Um, at some point, I want to support Ansible playbooks as part of this, but we're starting to get further down the, the roadmap. 
Um, but to answer your question, we could have done that. We did not. It's, it was easier to do it this way. What is test cloud? Um, so test cloud, I suppose I probably shouldn't have assumed everyone knew what that was. Um, so mm -hmm. test cloud is started life as a script written by one of our coworkers because he wanted to test cloud images. Because the, <laughs> the, the, the raw and the QCOW2 images that get produced for Fedora, you can't just throw those at Virtual Machine Manager and boot them. But it's a package that I can install. And yes, and it's run. in Fedora 23. It's not a infrastructure, a piece of infrastructure. Nope. Okay. No, it is, it, is a, it is designed to be bought. This. It is when you want a cloud but have no interest in either depending on or installing OpenStack. Um, it is, you basically, you feed it a cloud image and it, um, uh, prepares uh, disks in such a way that CloudNet will work. Puts a pa injects a password, mm. um, does a few uh, increases the size of the disk if you want, and then boots it as a local virtual machine. It's sort of the answer to the question, uh, but we get a lot because the cloud image does not have a password. Yeah. You cannot log into it unless you do something, you know, special. And so this one of the special things is feed the metadata in, and any real cloud environment has that very easily accessible. Yep. Yeah, and pre does it, but um, your machine doesn't. So we were getting a lot of questions about that. And so it's really just a, it's a convenience. It started off as a convenience layer for booting virtual machines, um, but we use it because it is simple and doesn't require. It still lets us have this paradigm of um, you can go install libtaskatron, and you can install test cloud, and you can run it basically on your local machine um, without the need for production infrastructure. So it's trying to keep with that where if we were depending on OpenStack, well, we could tell people to install OpenStack. I think that would be, I think, a bit much and somewhat naive. But um, that's, what, that's really why we went with Test Cloud instead of um, you know, OpenStack as one of the better known things. Okay, so it's implementation detail, more or less, yeah. from my point of view. Yeah. Can you do parts of the task locally? Hmm? Can you do parts of uh, a task locally or uh, yeah. right. parts of an execution locally? It right now it is all or nothing. Okay. Um, we we don't have we don't support the concept of uh, you know some things locally, some things remotely. It would be cool, for example, if I wanted to uh, uh, check out the latest uh, you know uh, the latest uh, comment for let's say some ARM. Uh, application mm -hmm. and then uh, cross build it and then uh, install that and test it and so because you know I don't want to build it slower or something like that so to test something that would run on a machine which doesn't have enough resources to build something fast I would rather build it locally and then so you can cross compile a binary you copy it over and I want the cross compile to be a task because I would right. like to see that it passes or fails as well right. okay. just, just saying that would be cool to have yeah and it's just, and it, it, if you have suggestions like that, um, let us know because, like I said before, um, we want to know what the pain points are, but there's another thing where there are parts of what we have set up that we have deliberately left as simple as possible because we want to see what people do with it. I guess the, going ahead, can you chain tasks? Do you have dependent tasks? It's yes and no. You cannot do it from the task itself, but every time you report, you put it into our result, our result system, that will emit a fed message, and everything from the parent yeah. Mascotron system is triggered off of a fed message. So you could do that. You could have, I mean, that you'd have to be in the infrastructure, which you would have your first test be the build the thing, and the second test be use the thing. Yeah. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so then you don't need to change it. There's one other thing. I, I hope I'm not giving you bad advice, but <laughs> uh, Beaker, for example, it, uh, uses a test harness, and at the moment that test harness is included in Python. But there's another one called Restraint, uh, Pico Project.org, if you want to check it out. And with Restraint, you can also run the tests locally. Okay. Maybe something to check out. I'm not sure if that will help you on that, but. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? This making sense so far, the difference between local execution, remote, and then the, this liver spawn a virtual machine for the purpose of running a task? Cool. So um, I'm repeating a bit, a few a bits here, but one of the things I want to emphasize because um, as we're getting to the point where we can accept tasks from other people, this I really want to make sure I'm clear, so this won't be the last time I say it. 
If you want to write something for Taskatron, you do not need to install the entire system. The only thing you need is, um, at a minimum, you need uh, libtaskatron core um, and probably libtaskatron fedora, both of which are a couple hundred K in size and have one or two dependencies. Um, when you start getting into the libtaskatron disposable, that's going to pull in libvert, which, depending on what's on your system, may pull in things. But at the most, you're going to be pulling libvert in, which is probably on a low, like it's on my laptop by already. Um, but once you have that installed, you can do pretty much anything that the production system can. You know, without the obvious exceptions of, well, it's not an infrastructure, it can't access the same machines, it doesn't have credentials, that kind of stuff. But you, the, that is one of the bigger design paradigms that we were going for, is that it's easy for people to write tasks for it. If you want to develop something for it, you install you know, one or two RPMs, and then you can go off and do pretty much what the production environment does. Um, so that, again, I will probably repeat myself again. Uh, so the other thing that we went for was basically keeping things as loosely coupled as sanely possible. Um, one of the, the thing, the precursor to Taskatron was very tightly coupled. So, you know, you couldn't, we had to change everything at the same time because you couldn't, you know, mess with this part. As soon as you mess with this part, you'd have to do something over here to, to mirror that change. And it gets, it got difficult for us to maintain this really tightly coupled system. So in this case, we have libtaskatron which is complex enough on itself, but that is only the runner. You know, that goes through, it reads how you've written the task, it goes through, it will spawn the virtual machine, it runs everything, and then pulls back data. It doesn't serve results. You know, it doesn't have a, a, an auth system. You know, it doesn't schedule jobs. It doesn't do any of that. Um, the, the system, the Taskatron system as a whole is not necessarily, well, is made up of many parts, of which libtaskatron is one. Um, we use buildbot for delegation. Um, we have a system called ResultsDB, which is on purpose very simple, um, but it is a database with a RESTful interface that you can put results into and you can query results from, um, and it all comes out in JSON. We have uh, what we call execDB, which is, for lack of a better way to put it, a reference point. So the purpose of ExecDB is when we start all of this, we say, hey, look, we had this signal that was a new build of HTTP. And when that happened, we scheduled this task, this task, and this task, and these are the URLs to get to it. Um, so it's, so we can change out any single one of these pieces without having to worry about some of the problems you get with the really tightly coupled systems. Um, and the last thing is, the, we don't want to restrict people to a single language or framework. Um, you know, I can sit here and list off several frameworks, several, you know, harnesses, several things that people use, um, not even getting into different languages. Um, just because, I mean, we, we do use Python. Um, Libtaskatron was written in Python. Uh, you will get the most convenient convenience methods if you also use Python and use our utilities. But as long as what you're running spits out something we can understand, be that XUnit, um, XML, TAP, or um, we have a results YAML format, then it can be understood and it can be reported to the right places. Um, it can show up in Bodhi, it can show up on dashboards. Um, it can do all of those things. Um, so that the emphasis there is as long as that interface, that results interface is there, um, you can use libtaskatron for whatever you had. Any questions at this point? Okay. So getting into writing tasks. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, as far as spawning, machine, uh, spawning virtual machines, Fedora 23 plus is needed. Um, the, we've, libtaskatron should work with anything Fedora 21 plus, or well, that's what we've tested it with. Um, but it is, Python, it is also Python 2 for now. Um, just looking at some example jobs, I'm going to skip this one for now because basically that's what I'm going to walk people through. Um, one of the other ones that I wrote recently, and hopefully I have the network to actually load it. Um, so for Docker, 
um, their upstream uh, their, te their upstream test suite that is run in um, Autotest, and it's something they call Docker Autotest because that makes sense. Um, and what this will do is it builds, you know, it spawns that virtual machine, it installs Docker, installs all those dependencies, and runs through the entire upstream test suite, and then translates that into a pass fail that we can then put into our systems. What interface is this? I don't understand. What the do you mean? picture. This, uh, this is Bitbucket. Bitbucket? Yeah. Okay. Which we will be migrating off of soon. Okay. Um, it was just one of those. Didn't have a good option at the time. Bitbucket's just as good as bad as GitHub. So, okay. but yeah, this is Bitbucket. Where, where are you going to? Where are you migrating to? Um, either Pajur or Fabricator. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Our yeah. Fabricator instance. We it wasn't originally set up for Git hosting. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it's, um, this is also this is all public. Um, everything's under, for now, is under the Fedora QA thing on Bitbucket. Um, so you can see all of our current production tasks. Um, there's libtaskatron. Um, this is for building images. The, this is the check that we're going to be writing, or that I'm going to run you through writing. And then here is the, the Docker auto test um, task that I was talking about. Okay, so before we get into the details, I just want to talk more about what the idea is behind what I'm going to try and walk you through. Um, so HTTPD, I just kind of chose somewhat at random because we had a Fedora test case for it, and it's a package that most people have at least a pa are at least familiar with what it does, um, even if they haven't used it before. Uh, and it was I wanted to demonstrate that we can take you know, something like this that was written before we had much of an automation system and then without too much effort um, we can have a wrapper around it and have that run for every build of that package. Um, and you are welcome to type along. Um, some of it may get a bit long, so like I said, it's already in Git. It was on the flash drive that went around already. Um, All right, so let's uh, try and get started. Uh, do, are all the people who are trying to follow along, do you have libtaskatron installed? Does anyone, let me rephrase that. Is anyone following along and does not have libtaskatron installed? All right, I will take that as a no. Um, and uh, does everyone have the disposable image? Um, oh, sorry. So, and this is in copper. Is it going to be in for proper or what? Is That's it a, it's on our to do list. Moving too fast, or is it? We just done? it hadn't been a priority. Um, when it was just us writing tasks, it didn't matter all that much, and it's just we haven't gotten to it yet. So it should, as far as I know, there's only one thing we need to change before it'll pass a uh, review for Fedora. Um, and uh, the, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, and then the, the thing that's on there is a gzip file that will need to be extracted before um, it's actually useful. I think somebody did that already. Let's extract it. Oh, no, that's right. I did that before I put it on there. Yeah, <laughs> which is actually bad because it's slower to copy the whole one from the thing that would be done to extract it. But, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you know, sorry. Yeah, I just, I was hurrying and I just unzipped it and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, that eh. dash K, who needs dash K? Um, so as a summary of what we want to do is we're going to download and install um, the latest HTTPD build. Um, we are going to run some uh, simple tests um, using the scripts that were already written. Um, and report the results we find. And if it will play nice, uh, generate an HTML report. So, hmm, a side effect of not having taught many people how to do this before. So I am missing a bunch of steps. <laughs> 
So let's get do let's do those before I confuse people more. Um, so there's some, there are there's a bunch of configuration that's going to have to happen, um, and I'm I am writing these things down so in the future it's not quite so painful. Uh, but for now it's still we're learning. A quick question: Is yes. this distinct from the directory on the USB drive that says task HTTP check, or is that the same thing? Basically the same thing. It is the same thing. That I, I mean, I just I wrote it and figured that's you know a good way to you know if you choose to you can follow along and write it yourself or you can see what I've already written. Um, but configuration wise, can one of you guys take notes um, as far as what we're going on? Because I'm not sure all of the stuff is in the documentation. Thank you. Um, find a terminal. That's there we go. Um, so the first thing, after all that's installed, the first thing that we need is um, Etsy, uh, what do we want to start? Let's start with Taskatron, um, taskatron.yaml. Because I know if I open up, well, but the problem is if I do this, Regular VI. Oh, it's because I'm an idiot. All right, so wrong machine. That was uh, on a virtual machine, not on my local. So um, this is the main task. Or this is the main configuration file for Taskatron. Um, the way that we have this written out, the defaults are in here already. Um, so, and the default. Otherwise, they are at least mentioned. Um, for the moment, the thing that we want to change is closer to the bottom is this um, image URL. Um, it, for now, libtaskatron needs to be pointed to exactly where that image you downloaded is the, or copied off the USB stick um, in the format of the file URL. Um, so that's where I happen to have mine. Um, wherever you put yours is going to change depending on the exact point in the file system. So is this configuration system like configuration file normally system wide, or is it just a convenient place to put the default? Could I have a per user one? Or we don't support a per user one. That is something that we I don't know. It's it's going to depend on how we go forward. Honestly, this is a temporary thing. Eventually, what we want to do is we want to say, hey, look, here's all here's a place where we put images. Find the most recent one of the type you're looking for and go boot it. Um, for this particular piece of configuration. Uh, the assumption so far has been it's going to be one configuration file per machine, but I don't think we're tied to that. It's just that's how it works. You might be able to use Glance for that. It's the image store from OpenStack. It might be able to set that up standalone for the image store. Image, it, it, we, I'm trying to, I'm trying my very hardest not to use anything from OpenStack because it scares me. It's all in Python. It's beautiful. No, uh, it's beautiful it, as long as you're a user of it and you're yeah. not maintaining it. Right, yeah, uh, I, I don't know how much that, it, it used to be that that could be installed as a standalone, just a little thing by itself, but it might have grown, you know, tendrils and yeah. everything else, so I don't know if that's a good idea or not. Yeah. Um, we'll um, mm -hmm. Would you mind just sharing what file that is again? I, I, I missed it. Yeah. Just, just task, 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 tab, 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 tab. So just to be clear, when you run a command, you can't say dash f and then a path to a like a alternative file. Can you support that? I thought it was just um, it will look in your local directory. Okay. First. Okay. For a, I think it's is it dot is it local directory then conf. I don't remember. There's there's two classes. Uh, of I was, it seemed like a second ago when he asked if this was a global configuration file or if you could like have alternate ones. It seemed like it was just this location that could be used. But then I asked if you could pass dash f and give it an alternative. But then you just said if you if it will look in the local directory first, which solves the same problem, I think. Yeah, I don't remember the exact uh, path. No, it's we don't have the common line option for that. Okay, so but, it, exactly but it will look at the one in the local environment. One, for, uh, one extra location, 
which is when you check out from the Git repository, you can just use the conf directory, directory that is in there, but uh, you have to know about it. I think we don't have it really documented. Yeah. No. And it's, it's a, it's, if there's demand, that option could be added pretty okay. easily. Yeah, we should add Because it's just, it's a configuration setting. Okay. And then the next one is going to be aware of the irony that I said that this was supposed to be easy to set up. I have a question about yep. the intent with this. Say I want to test different distributions, different with different dependencies installed in packages. Is this like the recurrent staging image that I go into and then I have nested virtualization and start other VMs? Or would I have one of these for each of the configurations and change the configuration? To reflect that. I'm not so sure I understand your I'm, question. I'm testing Fedora 23 and Fedora Rawhide. Mm -hmm. That's right. what I want to test my packages against, mm -hmm. in a simple case. Um, do I have different configurations with this? Or do I have like one Taskatron base image, and in within that, I stage nested virtual containers and start Fedora 23 and Fedora um, Rawhide? The way that we had in mind was to have the basically the same task um, executed for different versions. Um, honestly, that starts getting into details that we haven't actually implemented yet. So if you have ideas on how to make that better, um, I'm definitely all for it. Uh, but uh, the idea that I had in my mind was to try and keep it like Diskit so that you have a task file in a master branch, F23 branch, F22 branch, F21 branch, just because the concept is there. and I think that it's going to be somewhat rare that the exact same test with the exact same arguments and the exact same things are going to be used for the rawhide version, the 23 version, the F22 version. Um, so to answer your question. Yeah, hmm? I'm not quite be able to elaborate. So I think what started to what, what bores us is that this is in Etsy. So this is a global configuration file. And for me, this looks like it should be a parameter for the, for the test. Right. It will be eventually. Yeah. I guess it's it's one of the next features that's on our list is to like the the hard coding of um, the image location is a very short term thing. Okay. And this um, is the local running is basically a hacky thing that you do to for development, maybe larger for development of Taskatron. The real tests are running in a different environment. Right? They the are running in a similar environment. For right now, we only su we don't support s specifying your environment, um, but that's the thing that's coming. Um, is that it's going? You're going to be able to specify. I want for you know rawhide. I want 23. I want to have you know the server edition. I want to have the workstation edition. Those kind of things. Specify that, and mm -hmm. then it'll be smart enough to say, hey, or the, this will basically be an image directory. It's like go look here for images. And then it will be able to find the newest image that is, you know, F24 uh, server. Um, so it does not do that now. That is on the feature list. Will it be able to bisect and figure out where my test started failing? If I, I we have I have no idea. Wouldn't that be cool? Uh, it would be, but <laughs> I'm as long as that. As long as you don't have to write back. <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of. Like, um, how close are we to my dream of having, um, you said like diskit, having literally the tests be checked in next to the next to the packages? Um, they, uh, I'm just trying to think of how to answer that. <laughs> it's. Do you know what I'm asking? Yes, I do, and I'm trying to because I I just learned something new today that changes my answer. Um, actually not that far away um, because there's been some changes in package DB and there's been changes in how they're doing diskit so that they already have um, multiple repositories that are grouped under the same umbrella that have um, separately controllable ICLs so it shouldn't and I know I just swore um, <laughs> as a tester the should, should is the S word um, it shouldn't be too bad because the Git stuff is already taken <laughs> it care must of not for be us. Too bad. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, the Git stuff, most of the Git stuff is already taken care of. Awesome. So it's going to be a matter. Of, the hardest parts are going to be figuring out a format and convention, format and conventions. Yeah. Because um, I don't. 
and how we want to show the the test the task git repo as part of the package git repo if that makes sense yeah it makes a lot of sense I don't um, know because I mean there, there's there's questions it's like okay so then do we have it as as a sub module do we just have it as another checkout that's the you know like as that that package can manage yeah um, there are all those kind of things that the haven't quite figured out the details on but the the git stuff is mostly there would not take much to add a task git repository that is attached to each package. Um, if, if that's what I've been told about package DB oh, is that that feature was added recently. So like if you do a no, package no. clone recently, um, it will have a message about how this isn't really what you cloned. It was supposed to be something like RPM. I don't remember exactly what it was. It just happened when I cloned a repository recently. And so that's what it's doing. When you do the fed package clone for that package, it does some switching behind the scenes to point you at a specific package repository instead of just named as the URL you are using. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Okay. Um, that is the only thing we need to change in here. Um, the other thing. This is why this all needs to be written down. Um, other thing that we are going to need is an SSH key. Um, and it does have to be uh, passwordless. I mean, you can just do, um, wow, my brain is not working right now. It's, um, oh, SSH key gen. I can type, I swear I can type. Um, just do SSH keygen um, ID RSA task, and then emphasis on no password. Um, the way things are set up right now, if you have a, a key with a password, it will not work. Um, and then one of the things you need. Is that true even if my key is in my key ring? Is that true even if my key is in my key ring? Yes. The, the only thing we really support, I don't think, we don't support key rings. Um, it has to be files, it has to be passwordless. Um, This is the important part. Um, is right here. This I just that's for convenience. You can set it really to whatever you want. Um, there is. I wish I had the original file. Um, I th think. Huh? This is the the Etsy test cloud settings.py. Um, but the important thing here is that um, this is basically a template. But what we need is users. And then the deep is this readable? Yeah. Okay. It's this. It's this part right here. The user's part of this YAML, and then the SSH key that you generated goes in single quotes. And also that thing where it looks like cloud config is a comment up there. Don't be fooled. That's cloud and it being stupid. That is actually configuration. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Also, if anyone knows of an alternative to cloud init, I am all ears. <laughs> I am not a huge fan of cloud init, but I don't know of. Um, Alternatives. The problem is we needed the alternative four years ago before CloudNet became prevalent, yeah. and now it needs to be not just less crappy; it needs to be compellingly better. And this is fine. That's the so <laughs> it's fine in most cases. Yeah, there right. Are, exactly. So when it starts getting in the way of my stuff booting, I start running out of patience with we, it. Yeah, we have a yeah. It's a market problem. It's, it's why do you bug it? Why do you bug it? It's just like, it's just cattle. Yeah. Just get it right, yeah. yeah.
I'm just uh, when it, I'll just wait until I stop hearing typing, and I will assume that. <laughs> Does that mean something? That, that means people are mostly done with their configuration. Is anyone? I mean, is anyone having trouble with this? Is anyone having questions while typing happens? What are, what is going to be the best way to make this easier? Sir, any ideas on what the best way to make this easier would be? Yeah, it should all happen automatically. <laughs> I'm looking for more details. This time. <laughs> yes. we, should, we should generate the uh, test cloud config file on the fly. Yeah. And we should well, just or, the, or change test cloud to support passing the configuration in so it's yeah, not right. tied to a single configuration right. file. We set everything from scratch. Awesome. That would make a lot of sense. And the only piece of information you will need is like the path to your SSH path queue. Yeah. That's or cool. even allow generation of one. Or we can generate one on the fly. And the percent %s is also important. It's a quirk of test cloud. Because if there isn't at least one percent %s in there, it will fail. I like how you have a super secure password there. Selected. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's not only. So is there, an, is there a need for a password um, since you have the key? Not, there is no need for it. Test Cloud will set it. So if you don't have it in there, Test Cloud will explode. Okay. So do we need it? Do we need to use it? No, does it need to be there? Yes. <laughs> All right, is, every, is everyone done with this part of the config? All right, now we can actually do something. <laughs> So we can go back, and um, I'm going to choose not to do um, all of the fancy remote stuff, just because the network is so bad here. I've not been able to get one run to finish today before the network times out. Um, so we're going to go about it a slightly different way. Um, do create one. Um, we can do test cloud instance create. Um, URL and then give it the same. Uh, well, then you can also consider just running it locally. Yeah. But it, this task installs HTTPD. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh. Um, That's so, yeah, I mean, you'd basically. Oh, huh. how about I give it a complete command? So the, the format of this is this is the name of then the virtual machine you're creating and here's the URL to the file that it's going to use to create that virtual machine. And the first time you use an image, it's going to take a little bit longer because uh, the way the test cloud works, it's copying it to its internal cache so it can create a backing store from it. Here's the command. Does that make it harder or easier to read? It's neutral. Okay. Trust the right into the test cloud. Oh. <laughs> More notes. Um, they need to be added to the test cloud group. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> like I said, this is um, I'm learning as I go with as far as the stuff that we don't that I we know internally and haven't written down. Um, so in order for test cloud to work, My you have to be part of the test cloud. <laughs> test <laughs> feel like, it. yeah. I know. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, the so you need to be part of the test cloud group in order to spawn virtual machines. Um, or if you have just some virtual machine handy, that will also work. You don't have to spawn it with test cloud. But do you need to be part of the test cloud group or part of if you already have part of the group that lets you spawn VMs? Will that work? No. No, you have to be part of test cloud right. because of the way it copies files. Okay. And because everything is awesome, if you are in a graphical development in a graphical environment, that means you have to log out and log well, back you, in. You can you yes. can you can do SU, SU dash in, in a terminal, and you will get the new ones for, oh. for the terminal. You will? Oh, yeah. Okay. You see, anything gives you a new login. 
Yeah. Yeah. You need a new login machine. So S U dash. But won't that give you? Oh no. Yeah, without the without the user oh, doesn't. And your username. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yes, username. <laughs> That is a longer start. We tried to do that, and it has its own set of problems. Um, it, it, like that's real. That's how the, the thing started. Is it would put stuff in the home directory, and libvirt starts freaking out and does weird things when it can't own everything, and then you start having directories in your home that libvirt needs to own and changes the ownership of. If you use the user session, not the system session of the system session, But if you use the user session, that means you don't have access to the networking thing. So if you want to have network access, no you don't. Yeah, I you tried need, this. You need, you need, and then maybe it's something's you changed. You to create the network once, and then you can... That's if you look at the cockpit. <laughs> the, the, I just re we, we, I remember going through this. Maybe something has changed, but that was one of the problems we had by using the user session instead. And oh, what was the other? There was another reason. Because we looked into using the user session, we looked into. You can the, the, the clue is that you can you can open the system session and read only if you want to access network information. That we didn't try. If you need if you need to get the, the like the IP address and everything. So for me, it tries to use the user session. Now here the test cloud thing, and but fails. Um, that is actually not. That is part of. Um, that's uh, <laughs> part of creating the virtual machine. Um, the, when you boot it, it ends up using the system um, session, um, but libguestfs is we use libguestfs to prepare it, and that will use the user session. Okay, but it doesn't work. Um, what is what is it saying? It says um, home dot cache libvirt libvirt sock no such file directory. <coughs> Well, it's weird that it tries to access the home. It should, it should use the system. Libguest, libguestfs. Oh, libguestfs. It's get, yeah, guest, libguestfs is what's doing it. I might have funny settings. I'm going to be learning. A, I'm learning a lot today. Yeah. <laughs> You're well, very welcome to contact us directly. Guest <laughs> <laughs> fish launch works by itself. So this is the back to the beginning. There's three different runners. One's the one that starts starts the VM, and one's the one that just does it locally. Maybe for the tutorial <laughs> next time, just do the local one if you don't have all this yeah. setup for people. Yep. No, like I said, some of this is me learning because yeah. I didn't think about that until after I wrote the task. And the problem is the task that I want to have people write installs HTTPD and downloads stuff, and then changes configuration file and really needs root access, yeah. which. I didn't really want. <laughs> I don't want Everybody running on wants my a web server on your laptop. Right which I don't want running on my laptop. I'm not going to stop you from doing it, but. Um, Second time looks better. Okay. Looks good. Yeah. yeah. All right. So does everyone have a virtual machine? Yep. Ish. No. Yep. yep. Oh, I think so. Yeah. So make note of the IP address, um, because we're going to need that. Okay, so um, 
let's get to actually creating the uh, task itself. So, uh, because one of the things we designed for is having everything in a Git repository, it is going to help you out later to create a directory for the entire task that will eventually be that Git repository. Um, this would just be my suggestion. For, this is what I use for names. Um, you are welcome to use whatever you would like. Um, but just creating those files. everyone is anyone still typing <laughs> all right it's, it's hard to tell when I can change slides and what you can't so getting started um, with this I'm actually going to switch over to is this readable it's okay um, I can change, I mean, okay. Uh, so the thing that every task basically needs is this part sends the comment. Um, so when we're going through this, each task needs a name, um, a description, which is really just something that is going to be shown to humans. Um, and the same thing with the maintainer. Um, the idea here is that if someone sees it and it's broken, they know who to at least start talking to um, about getting something fixed or what something means. The other metadata that is in here is describing the arguments and what we need. Um, there are only certain types of information that libtaskatron works with. Um, and for right now, we support Koji builds, Bodhi updates, composes. Um, God, there's another one. What am I forgetting? Oh, Koji Tag. Um, and there will be more in the future. Um, again, it's one of those things where the purpose of this is to serve people. So if there's stuff we don't support, tell us um, so that it can work for uh, what people want to use it for. Um, one of the other things you can do, and I'm just going to show this, this you don't, for this particular task, you don't need it. Um, you can also describe the environment and the RPMs, so that by describing the RPMs that need to be in the environment, uh, Libtaskatron will go try to install all of these if they aren't already present um, before the task is executed. But in the case of what we are trying to do here, we are going to download all the RPMs anyways. So, so well, does it get them from Koji otherwise, or does it get them? It from gets them from the repositories. Okay, so. Could do both prepare and then hold. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, for better or for worse, we've decided basically the tasks are basically YAML, um, which I imagine isn't anyone's favorite. But I'm not sure I've heard anyone go into a rage fit about having to write YAML. Um, if we chose to do this in Perl or Python, I imagine that might. We might Why have fits really? of rage. So it's bland and neutral. Um, and it should be enough to and it's enough to get the job done. The one of the concepts we have is these variables. Um, and this is, as far as I know, it's in the documentation. When you start this, there are certain variables that are already available to you. Um, this work dear, um, every time you start up a task, uh, libtaskatron will create a temporary directory for you. Um, and basically run everything in there, um, trying to keep the noise out of, um, or trying to keep things separated. Um, so that is one of the variables. Another variable is whatever um, we've passed in, because this would be an item type. You pass in you know, the value, whatever that Koji build is, um, which is available itself as a variable. If it were a compose, the name of the variable would be compose. If it was a koji tag, the variable would be koji tag. Um, and those are the variables you start off with. So we are going to do, we have a, I'm already rethinking how I'm doing this. Um, so 
the each task is made up of you know we have our metadata we have and we have our actions and actions are uh, directives of what we're calling them so we have a Koji directive we have a mash directive we have a Python directive all of these are in the documentation uh, or the online documentation as well um, but for the Koji directive um, we give an action which is download or download tag um, so there's there are some instances where we want to download an entire Koji tag and that will do that but in this case we only want the one build we want the uh, the build that we triggered on and we want to get the x86 64 arch and we want to get no arch and we want to download it to this directory so that, that gets all the sub packages of that architecture it will get everything from that SRPM if that, does that answer your question? Yeah. So every every RPM that was built as part or that was part of that build, and in this case we're just grabbing the x86 64 and the no arch ones. So it won't grab SRPMs and it won't grab x86 32. It won't grab ARM. If for some reason it wanted a source RPM, will it do that too? Yeah. It yes. You can use all. You can use source RPM. You can add. It's um, so like if I wanted that, I could do. Which directive has documentation online? So you can see the available arguments to those uh, options. All right, cool. Which I really, if I didn't, mm -hmm. I really sh hope I put that in the presentation. Um, Docs. Oh, yes, but I also have them built. So we do have, so like the, the directives, so like for example, we want the, like for example, Koji. So this is what we were just using. Um, so these are all online. Um, if you wanted to use Koji, it will tell you, so you have an action. It can either be download, download tag, or download the last stable one. So for example, one of the questions that came up earlier today was about um, comparing uh, the latest with a, you know, like the last stable build. So you can download the last stable build from Koji um, when you give it the new build. Um, but all this documentation is available um, online when you have competent network. I guess I could just check the documentation, but uh, what's the mesh action doing? Um, that is another thing that is a very much a Fedoraism, and that doesn't always occur to me that, that it's not commonplace. So MASH is a tool to create repositories. It is sort of oh, a superset okay. of create repo. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, the thing, the reason that we use that I use okay. MASH here instead of create repo is mostly because it was already there. But one of the things that MASH does is it handles multi-lib. Mm -hmm. So it will handle the getting the thirty-two x86 32. Um, bits to an x86 64 machine. Oh, I see. So when you just do create repo, you have three separate repos. You have the 32 bit, you have the source, you have the x86 RPM. When you point and mash at the entire directory, that you it will remove the 32 bit RPMs that would have conflicted. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. So you, or yeah. But in this exact case, it uh, 
it shouldn't have been necessary to have the directive here because ideally we would just install the packages that we downloaded. Yep. But we discovered some kind of bug or something. Maybe yeah, I, I have a I have a huge list of RFEs. Yeah. This is this dog foodie experience of me writing this has been incredibly instructive because it's like, well, this is stupid. <laughs> and Why does it work this yeah. way? We found out that we have to create a repository just to install the downloaded packages for some reason, so that's yes. why it's there. But Thank you, Diana. It should not be there. Okay. Yeah, because I tried doing, you know, downloading the packages and then just doing DNF install and then pointing it at the files. But if those weren't in the right order, DNF would refuse to install yeah, yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. So, hence the creating a repository and then mm. doing nastiness that shouldn't have to do. Mm. So, I suspect that with, because I think I have, how much time left? Like 30 minutes or something like that? It was two... Actually, eight minutes. Eight minutes? Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, so I think we are going to wrap up. <laughs> so I think we'll, we'll wrap up the official parts of this. Um, so I'll just kind of go through what it's supposed to do, and then I will show what it looks like when it runs. So what we are doing, and this will change because this is a pain in the butt, um, you're downloading the, the, the new RPMs and then making them into a repository. And then we're running a, we're delegating out to the Python directive. So the Python directive is loading this other Python file. It's calling prepare. And then these, the things after the callable, those are variable list of args that get passed into the function. Or the callable, it can be a method, it can be a function. So in this case, it goes out to this prepare, where you can see some of the insanity. The, um, so it will, um, so we have two arguments here which come from the, these two will match up. And so it pass, when you use these, it will use the keyword args. So um, it will be in that order, but it also will give them keyword args to match the names that are here. Um, then it goes through and it does all of this, which is basically uh, some nastiness that shouldn't have to happen so you can install from a local repository. Um, install our packages using DNF, um, starting HTTPD, um, and, and restarting it to make sure that it caught um, the mod PHP and mod SSL. The next thing we do is we actually, um, huh, that shouldn't be there, uh, the, we actually run the tests. So that again, we're doing the Python directive, we're delegating to HTTPD test.py, which is in, and this callable, and so we have the, the original test case had these shell scripts. So we had the basic auth, we had PHP, serve HTML, serve HTML, SSL, and then vert host. Um, and this is just a Pythonic way of going through all those shell scripts, um, then um, creating check detail results. And this is one of the advantages you can get by writing things in Python. Um, we have a bunch of convenience methods already there. So like, for example, the, this check detail um, you can change the result, you can, add, you can have um, multiple check detail objects, and then when you're done, you just pass it into this check.exportyaml, and it's relatively future-proof, um, because that's the interface that we use. So if there are any changes in the future, um, this will still work, um, versus you know, manually constructing something. Um, but then it will just run through these things and show the results. And the command to do this, so I'm going through. Run task is the, the entry point for the runner. And the part of this, part of what Taskatron does is we have this uh, key value pair. So we have the, you know, we're talking about the, the Koji build, Koji tag, Bodhi update, compose is what we're supporting for now. So this is the type. So we're giving the type of a Koji build. And this I just grabbed out of Koji. This is the most recent HTTPD build, um, but as an item. And we're using SS SSH is for the pre-existing virtual machine. And then I give it credentials. So I have root at that um, IP address. And for the sake of completeness, I am telling it where 
But this is something you can put in the configuration file, but for the sake of completeness, I'm putting on the command line as well. So use this private key when you open the SSH session. Or if you have it in the home slash dot SSH, it should like find it automatically. Yeah. Um, and then pointing it at that YAML file, which from where I happen to be is in the previous directory and then giving it the YAML file. So I enter and it goes through and I don't think I need to narrate the output that's going across the screen. But it goes through, it tries to install all that stuff. Um, it's already installed, so there's nothing to do. Ha, <laughs> now it's funny. This is gonna fail because I already ran the task in here. Oh well, this sort of failure looks like. Um, oh no, they all passed. Cool. So I like being wrong in those in the, in those cases. So going through this is you know it's just showing it's in pretty much in debug mode. So it's relatively verbose, but it's going through and it's saying what it did. So we downloaded all the stuff for for the RPMs. Um, we created the repository. Uh, went through, installed the packages we needed, and then started running the um, actual tests. So here are what would have been reported if we actually had this hooked up to a reporting mechanism. So the basic auth passed, PHP failed, serve HTML passed, um, serve SSL passed, vhost passed. Um, and then it stored the artifacts from this in this directory. So, I realize I kind of breed, I, I think I'm over time, aren't I? Not yet, we have three minutes. So three I'm, minutes? I'm, I'm lying to you with this, but... Okay, yeah. I thought I was out of time already, so... No. Um, I realize I breezed through that, and I appreciate... Um, uh, I appreciate <laughs> staying here, paying attention, asking questions, pointing out where the weaknesses are, because that... You, I find that I can be way too close to things, so it's like all of a sudden, you know, what, what is Nash? Well, of course everyone knows what Nash is. Um, but, like I mentioned, just dog fooding is, I have a huge list of RFEs um, just from writing that simple task. Um, if there are things that you want to do that you find you can't do, please let us know. If you run into problems, please let, let us know. Please come find me. If you can't, I mean, it's like we're in, Fedora, we're in Pound Fedora QA um, on Freenode. Um, I'm Tim Flink, uh, tflink at fedoraproject.org, tflink at redhat.com, um, IRC Nick is tflink. Come find me and ask me questions. I am more than happy to help. I want people to start using this. I want to help people, um, help get this in people's hands. Uh, so please let us know, let me know if you have uh, questions or if you have suggestions. And malformed links, go. Um, and that's just basically what I had said. And things that I've learned is that dog fooding is a good idea. And <laughs> don't count on network for a demo. Those are the things that I have learned and relearned. Yeah, malformed docs, awesome. So uh, that would be pretty much it. Does anyone have questions, comments, thoughts? <clears throat> Rotten vegetables, hopefully not. Thanks for asking. Right. Well, thank you very much. And again, please, if you have questions, if you have comments, please let me know. Before I walk off. Uh, yes. Can I get those slides? Uh, yeah, they're not finished. I can. <laughs> yeah. One, one little question. Have you heard about Mikado? Yes. So, like, is, like, are you, like, I think what you're trying to do is, has a lot of, there, there. I agree that there are a lot of parallels, and there is some intersection. I don't think it's the same thing. Um, it's not. Yes, I agree. There are. There's. There's a decent amount of overlap. Um, you got it. Nope. I'm trying to think of. We we are a little bit more language and test agnostic. They have a lot more uh, deep test. Like a, like really cool testing features, I guess I would say. Um, one of the things that I would I'm interested in doing eventually is integrating with Avocado so that we can you know use that as a runner. Um, yeah, that's the one I was thinking of. I mean, one of the biggest differences, correct me if I'm wrong, is OSCs, that you have these, these 
the YAML for tasks and different things. I think that's where I see the future value. So that list of actions mm -hmm. expands. Yeah. You have a good, you can have a lot higher level of, 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 of abstraction of the tasks. Yeah, just keep, keep in mind that you have seen just a small bit of the whole task control. So what makes the whole task control we have the trigger which listens for events and fires the relevant actions or the tasks. Yeah, but so hopefully, we hopefully, they, hopefully they won't have to care about it. So the lead task control is, you, might have some overlap with Avocado, but it's just a small, small part of the, of the task control framework as a whole. So yeah, we definitely think about like integrating other test runners into it, and still we will use all the you know all the other pieces of the task of the framework. The question is how much infrastructure would need to set like would I need to set up if I set up for writing like, tasks? Okay, so I need to like, test different distributions separate. Well, um, when we stay with Fedora, you should just need to pass it on, and then you can write the task. And if it works for you, you can submit it, I don't know, into some repo and ask us to execute it on every new package build or something like that. And it, like, it should be everything you need just to pass it on. And we handle all the I'm tip. Oh, oh, sorry. I just reflexed. Yeah, so that has the one there and it fixes it the I see that the open test is not open. So I don't. I can't test the case or have the test. Mm -hmm. And it is the case with. Like the multi host. Or even just one. Say I'm not the same. Say one test. If the firewall is blocking my access. Yeah. How does it test that? The status for a while is the API package diff was not. Yeah, we don't, we don't, we don't have for, for a while. Yeah, I know, I know it's done now. Um, as far as I know, all the features that were needed in libtask are in there.